I hear it. Bang! And the next thing I realize is I am lying down like this. I got shot. I fell back into the couch and on the floor. This is Bart Whitaker standing at the same place where he was shot more than a month earlier on December 10th, 2003. The Whitaker family had just returned home after enjoying Bart's success, but they couldn't have predicted what awaited them back at home. Sheriff 911, station emergency. Yeah, I've been shot. Who's been shot? Uh, it's my mom and my dad and my brother. Hold on one second, sir. Engine one, all we have one subject right now. Apparently the whole family's been shot. Bart's mother lay by the entryway his father at the doorstep, and his brother was in the living room. All four of them were shot, but two would end up dying. Meanwhile, neighbor Stanley Cliff witnessed the aftermath of the shooting and dialed 911 too. 911. Someone has just shot another. Who's been shot? Uh, Trisha and Kit. Who shot them? Uh, we don't know, someone in the mask. What kind of injuries do they have? I, I don't know, they just been shot. As assistance was on the way, Stanley applied pressure on Kent Whitaker's wound. But all Kent managed to say was a warning. Run away. Get out of here. He may still be inside. Who was he? And what was the motive behind this shooting? Norman Kent Whitaker and Patricia Whitaker had met each other on a blind date in their 20s for the first time. They both felt a strong connection that went more than just a date and ended up in a happy marriage within a couple of months. Kent was a comptroller in a family-owned business, and Patricia, who went by Tricia, was an elementary school teacher. On December 31st, 1979, they welcomed their firstborn son, Thomas Bartlett Whitaker, known to everyone as Bart. He was just the beginning of what would come to be known as a vibrant, healthy, and loving family. Bart grew up to be a promising young man, he not only did great in school, but also possessed a quirky sense of humor. One of the strongest bonds in Bart's life was his father, Kent. They even participated in organized biking events. Bart was an undergraduate student at Sam Houston State University. His family was proud of him and didn't hesitate to show it often in the forms of words or gifts. He became a big brother to Kevin, who was born on March 19, 1984. Bart and Kevin grew up together and were as close as brothers could get. Merry Christmas! Yes! 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 Kevin, look what you got. I see one right here. I get it! I get it! At the age of just 19, Kevin often displayed a strong sense of maturity. Being the more sensitive one of the two brothers, he would confront injustice without hesitation. But he was also the one who forgave quickly. On December 10th, 2003, Bart had called his mother to tell that he'd taken his one last final exam and was on his way to be graduating soon, to which Trisha had expressed to Bart that she was so excited she could jump up and down. Bart wished to mark the occasion by dining out with family and celebrating. And to do the same, in the evening, the family of Ford drove for about 10 minutes from their home in the Sugar Lake subdivision to nearby Stafford to dine at the popular seafood restaurant Papado. It was a happy night for the Whitakers. Trisha gifted Bart his graduation gift, a Rolex watch, the one he'd always wanted. There were giggles, exchange of jokes, and a lot of familial teasing of one another. It was the kind of fun that remained with the Whitakers as Kevin drove the family back home. Upon returning, Bart went to collect his phone from his car, the Yukon. Meanwhile, Kevin unlocked the front door, oblivious of what and who waited for him inside. As he entered the dining room, a gunshot went clean through his chest. As he fell to the floor, the car keys in his hand landed right beside him. The bullet had penetrated through his heart. Just as Patricia entered, a second bullet passed through her chest. Kent was still on the front porch. As he heard shots, he felt the burn of a bullet through his chest, shattering the humorous bone in his shoulder. Bart rushed in behind his father and entered the home. He found himself in the middle of a violent scuffle, struggling to defend himself amidst the chaos with a masked man and got shot in his upper left arm before he chased the gunman out the back door. It was at this moment when the neighbor, Cliff Stanley, rushed to the scene and spotted Kent on the front lawn. 
He immediately removed his shirt and applied pressure to Kent's shot wound before making a call to 911. Until the paramedics and police arrived, Kent lay wounded and in agony of pain, praying to God that if it was his time to die, he was ready, but he asked for his family to be spared. Even the prompt arrival of the Sugarland police was not enough to save Kevin Whitaker. With his heart pierced, he was gone on the spot, a DOA or death on arrival. Trisha Whitaker was barely alive when the police arrived and was airlifted to Memorial Hermann Hospital, but couldn't make it, succumbing to her injuries en route. Kent Whitaker was in agonizing pain and was going to be so for a long time. He'd survived a fatal attack, but had sustained serious injuries and was admitted in ICU. Bart was hospitalized with non-life-threatening injuries. Meanwhile, the case was assigned to Detective Marshall Slot, who had just returned from church with family when he first received the news. The initial information I received was that a family had gone out to dinner and they returned home and had surprised a burglar in their home. As the investigation started, an alert was put on for residents as law enforcement feared an armed killer was on the loose and had ample opportunity to cause harm again. Investigators initially speculated that the burglary had gone wrong when the family walked in on the burglars and surprised them. But once Detective Marshall Slot combed through the Whitaker home, he didn't find the theory plausible anymore. There were too many inconsistencies. To begin with, neither the valuable items in the house were moved around, nor was anything missing. Electronics, televisions, jewelry, and other valuable items were left in their place. Furthermore, in the master bedroom, both the dresser drawers and the armoire were wide open. However, the disorder usually ensued with burglary was absent. Instead of being rummaged through for valuable items, the drawers were uniformly pulled open at equal distances, presenting a surprisingly orderly scene. It looked like the person who handled the furniture had a lot of time on their hands. The inconsistency didn't end here. There was no break-in. And finally, the murder weapon made it look all the more suspicious to the detectives. The murder weapon, a 9mm Glock handgun registered in the Whitaker's name, was found in the kitchen, but it was pried from a gun safe from one of the upstairs bedrooms, which was an isolated part of the house. Whoever did this knew what to look for and knew what was in the safe and exactly where it was. At this point, Detective Slot started to bring in other angles. He decided to turn his approach to the case more inwards. He focused more on familial ties and started with understanding how the relations of the late Trisha were with her husband Kent. Then, three days later, Bart was in a position to contribute to the investigation. An attempt was made to reconstruct the crime with the help of Bart. Now here, bang! And the next thing I realized is I am lying down like this. I got shot. I fell back into the couch and on the floor. However, it didn't prove to be very useful as Bart didn't seem to have seen the shooter because it was dark. There were other details the detective inquired about, but Bart's answers didn't prove to be very useful. Their radius of suspicion involved the rest of the family, Kent and Bart Whitaker and the people who knew them. Who would want to target the Whitakers? The progress seemed stunted on this end. Their loved ones and neighbors would not get tired of counting virtues of the perfectly beautiful family of the Whitakers and how they inspired them. When the investigators looked into Sam Houston State University, they initially conducted a routine inquiry and they didn't expect anything of significance. But what awaited them was nothing short of a bombshell. Investigators' inward approach brought them to a lie, a secret of a perfect family. When contacted, Sam Houston State University denied a Thomas Bartlett Whitaker enrolled as their undergraduate student. The occasion the Whitaker family spent celebrating their last evening together was a fabrication. Bart was never to graduate because he wasn't enrolled. In fact, he never even attended college after the freshman year. He had not even been attending the university. He was listed in their records as a freshman on academic probation. However, he kept his family under the impression that he went to classes every day. Kent Whitaker was in the hospital when he was informed about Bart's lie. 
Furious, Kent barged in on Bart in a wheelchair, demanding answers. I realized, how could he be so stupid? I was so mad at him. I got in a wheelchair and I wheeled down to his room and I just read him the right act about how if he had been telling the truth, he would not be a suspect. When confronted with the lies he spun, Bart told his father what he told the investigators. Bart answered that he didn't wish to disappoint his family. He was overburdened with the stress of school and desperately needed a break. He wished to help at work and planned on making up for the school in spring. But it looked like investigators had only one glimpse of what lurked behind the idyllic surface of the Whitaker family. It takes hidden flaws to be perfect, and the father was guarding some unsettling history. The fondness for the Whitaker family can be understood better by the number of people gathered on the day of the funeral of Kevin and Trisha Whitaker. More than a thousand people gathered to pray for the peace of departed souls. However, Detective Marshall stood there observant, wondering if one of these sad people was the masked killer of Kevin and Trisha. Police were trying to make a profile of the killer. In the first call to police, Bart had suggested that the masked man could have been black, but Kent had told them that he could see white skin around the eyes of the masked gunman. Following the funeral, investigators found it indispensable to look into Bart's background. His story didn't match up with reality once, and they weren't leaving any scope for that to happen twice. A little background search unearthed new developments. Bart had a criminal conviction from when he was 17. He attended Clements High School, where in 1997, he'd planned seven burglaries and led other young friends in on it. It was also the time when his parents had bought him several luxury vehicles. This conviction had Bart kicked out of his high school. The Whitaker family, especially Trisha, showed great joy at Bart's supposed graduation due to his initial education being difficult. A number of revelations had come out in Bart Whitaker's background search, yet the most unsettling discovery was about to be made. The investigators came across a 2001 report filed at the Waco Police Department. The report was made by a woman who had overheard Bart discussing killing his father with his friends. After the report, police officers from the Waco department had made an effort to visit the Whitakers, informing them of the conversation Bart had made. However, the report stated that Kent and Trisha found the idea of Bart planning to kill them inconceivable and found it an empty threat made by an angry son. But police were not as eager to scrap this information as were Whitaker's parents in the past. Presently, Bart and Kent had recovered and returned to their family home in Sugarland. As the investigation kept narrowing down on Bart, the investigators regularly visited or brought him in. It was no longer a secret who was the lead suspect of the police. Kent would often tell police that they were misguided in their approach. According to him, Bart was a victim of a heinous crime and police were prejudiced against him because of his past mistakes. Despite what Kent believed, the evidence against Bart kept piling up and the secrets of this suburban family kept spilling like they would never cease. One night around 11.30, a man visited the police department. He wished to speak to the lead detective on Whitaker's case as he waited in the dark of the parking lot. On seeing Detective Marshall Slot, the stranger told him that he had some crucial information regarding the case. The man introduced himself as Adam Hip. He told the detective that Bart Whitaker had approached him years ago and he asked for his help to kill his family. At the end of that conversation, they definitively pointed to Bart Whitaker as having some hand in the planning and carrying out of the shooting of his family. Adam Hip was Bart's former roommate at school. During this brief period of rooming with Adam, Bart had suggested killing his family in 2001. He further told Adam he'd inherit the expensive family property and insurance policy that amounted to around $1 million. Bart even went on to offer Adam a cut if he agreed to pull the trigger. The detective asked Adam if he could draw a map of the detailed plan that Bart shared with him, including the details of physical position as to where he was supposed to hide when the family entered, etc. Adam replied that he could, and he did. The diagram shell-shocked the detectives. This map was exactly what happened on December 10, 2003. It was a blueprint of the murders. The police had a solid story. 
Adam Hip had even described Bart's trick to fool the police by taking a shot in his own arm. Among many details was the possibility that Bart knew what was waiting for his family at home when they celebrated at the restaurant. Yet the evidence to press charges was not there yet. Detective Marshall kept having a conversation with Bart. He'd show Bart the police video trying to put together small pieces of the crime scene. During these conversations, it was clear that Bart was under the radar of suspicion. Yet he appeared composed and tried to help the investigators. He appeared to have nothing to hide. However, it irked Marshall that Bart was always too vague regarding the details like the direction he ran towards and the distance between him and the shooter. According to detectives, Bart didn't remember the details he should have. Police required more and so devised a plan. Adam Hip made a call to Bart Whitaker and the subject of killing the Whitakers was brought up. The police were recording the call. He told me how your mom and your brother were killed and how your dad and you were shot. All that was very similar to what one of our plans was. I'm not saying our plan. Okay. It wasn't, so stop saying it. All right. However, Bart didn't admit to killing his family to Adam Hip. Rather, he mentioned a former roommate, Chris Brashear. Investigators did a little digging and procured what they call a scent sample from a country club Brashear and Bart used to work in. They let bloodhounds sniff at the sample and the evidence they collected from Whitaker's house. The dogs identified Brashear's scent on the drawers of the master bedroom of Whitaker's home and on the murder weapon, Whitaker's gun. Following this, Chris Brashear became the prime suspect for the police and was brought in for a talk. He was asked to explain his whereabouts on the evening of the shooting. Brashear told them that he was at the Hooters with another roommate, Steve Champagne, and Champagne's girlfriend. Champagne was a U.S. Marine. When he was brought in, he initially denied knowing anything about the shooting, but the detectives found a way to get under his skin. They wouldn't let him go until his conscience began to get heavy on him. He was the first one to crack. His story began to change piece by piece. He came clean about his role on the day of the shooting. He drove Brashear to the crime scene. He parked two blocks away and Brashear went to Whitaker's home. He waited for them to walk in, and when they did, he killed them. Champagne's story led the detectives to Lake Conroe, where they were about to find a treasure chest of evidence. On the evening of the crime, a bag was disposed of in the lake. A search was conducted to fish out the bag. When the divers came up with it, it was the closest the police felt to a concrete lead. They weren't wrong. The bag was full of evidence. Two-way radios, water bottles the tools that broke open the gun safe, ammunition, and a smashed cell phone used during the time of the crime were found inside the bag. The water bottle had Brashear's DNA. Brashear and Champagne both had confessed to the detectives that they brought the horrors of December 31, 2003, acting on Bart's plan. Roles were classified. Champagne was a driver, Brashear was the shooter, and Bart the genius mastermind. Detectives knew the confessions and the bag built up sufficient evidence to press charges and it had taken them seven months to reach here. However, what they didn't know was that one of these days, Bart had woken up and told his dad that he was heading out to the club and had never returned. In September 2005, Stephen Champagne and Chris Brashear were arrested on the charge of the murders of Trisha and Kevin Whitaker. However, Bart Whitaker fell off the face of Earth. An international manhunt was in motion for the mastermind, and a $10,000 reward was also issued for any information leading to the fugitive. Sugarland law enforcement resented the absconding of Bart Whitaker. All of their police instincts signaled that it was Bart from as early as the day of the funeral. Yet he was gone from right under their noses. There was anger and a sense of failure let alone the trail of trauma he'd left in the minds of Sugarland residents. People don't run when they're innocent. What was left of Kent Whitaker's world came crashing down when he contemplated the possibility that his only surviving family might be the reason behind the end of the rest of his family. Days after the shooting, even before he knew who the culprit was, Kent had declared that he'd forgiven him. He called it God's calling. I realized 
He was leading me down the path, wanting me to forgive this nameless, faceless person in the ski mask who'd murdered my wife. But now it was his son, a son he'd not seen in months to ask why. As time passed by without any solid leads, months felt like years to Sugarland authorities and possibly to the broken father too. Finally, 18 long months after the murders, a man named Rudy Rios called in to say that a year earlier, a man had bought his identity for $3,000 and headed to Mexico. Rudy Rios could not give away his greed for $10,000 and ratted Bart out. And the tip paid off. On September 24, 2005, in a dramatic development, Bart was found, arrested, and extradited to the United States to face prosecution. He was charged with murder. Bart's father visited him, separated by a glass wall. Kent noted that Bart appeared fine, to which Bart responded affirmatively. However, he then admitted to his father that everything was his fault and expressed deep remorse. The trials began two years later in 2007. The jury found Bart guilty of planning the cold-blooded murders of his family with greed as an underlying motive. As for the penalty, after 10 hours of deliberations, the jury deemed the crime inhuman enough for Bart to get nothing less than a capital sentence. Bart was scheduled to die on February 22, 2018 at 6 p.m. through lethal injection. Generally, stories end here, but not this one. So when did you start thinking about killing your parents? You know, I don't, I don't actually know. I mean, it was not just this eureka moment where it just kind of came up and it was sort of a way of thinking this really awful thing in my head, the worst thing that I could think of as a way of kind of like venting, you know, if that makes any sense. It wasn't real, it was, it was not a, it's not a plan or a plot at that point. It was just sort of a way of, you know, shaking my fist at them in my head. Kent Whitaker had given his son, Bart, a lakeside house for his use, luxury vehicles, education, and something that upscale parents at times fail to deliver, rich devoted time. He was a loving father. He was also a faithful man, a good Christian. It wasn't too surprising that he chose to forgive his son. But what was truly impactful in the story was that Kent Whitaker would fight the next 10 years passionately and with all his might to commute Bart Whitaker's death sentence to a life sentence. Now remarried and in his late 60s, Kent Whitaker would file pleas, make public appearances, write applications, and talk to prosecution on why he deemed Bart was a good fit to get clemency. Kent objected to the capital punishment for his son, saying Bart was his only remaining family and that killing him would be like repeating the trauma on him that he'd already gone through. As the day of execution neared, Kent Whitaker readied himself to be in the same room where it was to take place. He said he didn't want to be there, but he would because he wanted Bart to know that someone cared for him and couldn't let him die alone with his bad choices. In order to move the sentence and authorities' emotions, he'd often explain how much change he'd seen in Bart, who'd taken anger management and religion classes. He completed his undergraduate degree and nearly wrapped up his master's as well. He forgave all the people involved in the murders. Kent Whitaker fought until he exhausted all his legal options, the last one being a written public plea to the Texas Board of Pardon and Paroles. On the day of the execution, Bart Whitaker was served his last meal, chicken enchiladas, rice, beans, and vegetables. Kent Whitaker went to see Bart in mourning. They both stood there, touched each other's hands through the glass, and said their goodbyes. Later in the evening, about 40 minutes before the execution, the family gathered in the execution room and held one another's hands, getting ready to say their final goodbyes. It was then that Bart's attorney, Keith Hampton, called Kent. On the verge of the capital sentence being executed, Keith had called Kent to tell him that they had the commute order. Abbott, a Republican in the U.S. state which carries out the most capital punishments, had a choice to reject or accept the board's vote. In a statement, Abbott said that this was the first time he'd granted commutation of a death sentence in the three years since he took up the role, allowing 30 executions to occur during the same period. 
Kent Whitaker, a deeply religious man, believed in miracles of forgiving, and he nearly manifested one out of a seemingly hopeless plea. Because who would have otherwise hoped for a man posing for pictures with those who admired him only to orchestrate their deaths shortly afterwards? The whole story was coming to an end. Three-fourths of the family was planned to be eliminated, and now half of it rested in peace. Bart was restrained without the hope of parole. But there were a number of people who were confident of something being even more wrong with Bart Whitaker than a man who murdered his family. A psychiatrist, Hollowell, suggested Bart was a person with a wholly different nervous system, something off with the wiring. Because sociopaths generally grow up with extremely traumatic events, but Bart grew up in a safe and loving household. He perceived rejection that was never there. What he did was in his DNA. That he showed almost no emotion. It was almost like he was mouthing the words. It was chilling. I was just blown away. Here's this young man who's done the, about the worst thing a person can do, and it's as if he's talking about the weather. Some cases are closed in documents just to be opened in mind. The damage done by this case was irreparable. Trish and Kent were like second parents to many in their community, a support system, which makes it even more twisted that their own child turned on them. The moments of a father and son cycling around and talking until the sun went down, a mother who would jump up and down for her son's small success, and a young brother with his dreams and aspirations like an open road ahead of him. Everything was cut short, never to return. The case serves as a somber reminder of how heavy bad choices can toll. It's a tough lesson on how not knowing what's going on within the people around us can leave lasting pain. Deciding whether to use the death penalty or life imprisonment is tough. Some say it deters most dangerous criminals, but others, like Kent Whitaker, think life in prison is better. It boils down to what people believe and the laws in place. So, do you think cases as heinous as Bart Whitaker's warrant capital punishment? Or, because of the irreversible nature of the death penalty and inhumanity, is life imprisonment a better option? Let us know in the comments section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hit that like button, and share our videos. Also, if you have any crime story that you'd like us to cover, leave us a message in the comments section below.